The Articulate Coven is the original, unofficial podcast and fan community for Anne Rice's Interview with the Vampire and Anne Rice's Immortal Universe from AMC and AMC+. Welcome to another episode of Articulate Coven, the unofficial podcast for Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles and the Vampire Lestat, including the upcoming TV series. And uh, we are your hosts. I'm Joel Sharpton. I'm Ashley wright Eiler. And we're here to discuss in this episode, Interview with the Vampire, the film starring uh, Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt. I almost got their last names backwards. I, here's the thing. It's so <laughs> weird to me thinking about where these two people were in my hierarchy of celebrities at the time that this movie came out versus where they are now and the different ways that I have felt about both of those men in particular, never mind the rest of the film, just those two guys in particular, the different ways I've felt about Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt over the, you know, 20 plus years since this movie came out. Um, I think this is going to be a very interesting conversation. Ashley, I'm excited to talk about it with you. Oh, me too. I'm thrilled. I agree. <clears throat> They've had a lot of ups and downs in my heart and soul since um, since this film came out. So, yeah, this is this is excellent. I can't wait to talk about it all, including the very bad. Wigs. Yes. Oh, my goodness. So many bad wigs. All right. Before we get into the wigs, uh, the good, the bad and the hairy, um, let's first do a little news <laughs> here. Uh, since we've last talked, uh, we've actually had uh, one burst of news from, uh, Anne and they've announced the partnership between Anne Rice, uh, Christopher, her son, and the uh, production company that's going to be responsible for putting the TV series actually on the air. Uh, the Vampire Chronicles is going to be brought yes. to you by Paramount TV and Anonymous Content. They're the uh, two companies that have optioned, um, the books. Interestingly enough, and this is something that I missed in the first go, um, Ashley, 11 books are included in this optioning. So that does not include the Vampire Chronicles that um, sort of branch off and connect with the Mayfair witches. So it doesn't include Merrick. It doesn't include uh, Blackwood Farm. And it doesn't include Blood Canticle. Um, but it's, Pandora's on that list, right? Yes. Pandora's there. Oh, and Blood and Gold, yes. which is the Marius book, is there. Uh, Armand yes. is there. Vittorio the Vampire even is included in the 11, uh, even though it's disconnected from the series series entirely vittorio mentions early on in the book he knows nothing of the articulate uh, coven uh and yet um that book is also included in this i think that's interesting because it says to me that their plan long term is to option the mayfairs as well and they want those books or those storylines to potentially be part of the mayfair series as opposed to the vampire series and if perhaps paramount and anonymous uh make a deal again with ann and christopher then they'll get those as well and if the same studio or the same network were to bring it all to you then perhaps they'd be able to cross over in the future but there's they're keeping those separate i think that's a good idea for tv i do too and i think that those if they do decide to add the Mayfair witches to the deal, then those books will offer a really good crossover and kind of start that introduction for the people who haven't read those books. You know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. So uh, to recap, and this is something that Christopher and Anne had already talked about, but they will be writing the series and they're going to serve as executive producers alongside um, uh, and anonymous contents, David Cantor and Steve Golan. Uh, the project is expected to be taken out to the network soon. As a matter of fact, I think they've already spoken to several networks. We still don't have any news about where this series is going to fall, uh, but Anne and Christopher are hard at work, and now they've got a team um, building around them. So exciting movement, and probably by the time you hear the next episode of the show or by the time we record the next episode, it's very likely um, that we may know where this series is going to end up. That's, that's very exciting, Ashley. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I cannot wait for this to really get rolling. And I do, well, do you want to say this, guys? If you are not following... Anne Rice on social media, please do. She's fantastic. And she really, she shares a lot. She's always been really great about that. I think with her fans, she's always been a very giving, you know, giving writer to, to be a fan of. And she and Christopher both have got really strong social media presences right now. And you can definitely get a lot of great info and just great conversation too. 
Well, and she's actively seeking feedback on the series, too. Like, Absolutely. She's asking questions from time to time. And there are specific things that she's now sort of curtailed. She's not taking uh, direct opinions on who should be cast, for instance, anymore <laughs> for individual characters because they're further along in that process. And they don't want to – well, lots of reasons that you don't want to do that at this point because they're actively talking to actors, I'm sure. Uh, right. But, to mention that, Ashley, it's interesting that you bring this her social media presence up. One of the favorite things, I think, about – uh, Anne is the way that she interacts with her fan base and the way that she really um, sort of wades among the masses, so to speak. She posted this the other day, and I, I wanted to include it in this episode. She says, I have no real update on our TV series. This is on her Facebook page, except to say that Christopher and I are loving the writing we're doing right now and the people we have the honor of working with. I am so deeply emotionally involved with my vampires that they're hyper real to me, a vibrant cast for our series in their own right, even when we are a year away from bringing flesh and blood actors and actresses into the picture. See Every film or series I see, I relate to our project, seeking to learn what I can from it, making middle notes galore. I'm seeing everything with new eyes. Believe me, I'll provide updates when I have them. In the meantime, imagine Christopher and me pounding away on our keyboards, emailing, phone chatting, brainstorming, and having the time of our lives. Now and then I think of how different this project would be if my son had not been willing to devote himself to writing this series. But he is committed to it, and I absolutely love working with him. In fact, he's the only writer I've ever been able to work with. I find myself falling, failing, uh, falling back on the old cliche, which shines bright for me. This is like a dream. Um, very sweet. And it, I, I mean, I can only imagine the idea of working with, you know, your son, um, later in life, especially you realize exactly how precious all of that time is. The two of them, I think, uh, maybe more so than, than some families understand it because of the loss of Stan so, so young. Um, so anyway, interesting, uh, that they are hard at work. And she also mentioned a timeline there a year or a year and a half away, probably from, from seeing flesh and blood actors and actresses in the roles. So. I think that's realistic. I think it's also, um, I, th- I think there's a timeline that's more optimistic than that. And I think it's entirely possible that let's say by Christmas time this year, that you and I know quite a few specifics about this series, where it's going to actually be presented to us and who the main players will be. And perhaps even a start date for production at that point so that we'll have some vague idea of when we'll see the series itself. So I, I don't think it's that far away, but, uh, and they're being re- realistic in her optimism. Well, absolutely. I mean, you never really know how long of a process all this is going to be. You know, I mean, things, the ball could get rolling really, really quickly once they land on a network um, or it could get dragged out because of contracts and things like that. So, I mean, I, I appreciate her being uh, realistic and uh, cautiously optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um all right. Well, why don't we go ahead and get into this episode and start talking about uh, Interview with a Vampire. Um, first off, why don't we sort of do a little opening statement here, if you want. Um, do you remember the first time you saw this series and, and sort of like what was your um, or the first time you saw this uh, this uh, movie, I should say, and what was your um, position in the fandom at that point? OK, so I was like. 15 when this movie came out because it came out in 94 and um i was like Anne, very skeptical about the casting of tom cruise i am not a huge huge tom cruise fan never really have been he is not really my jam um but i um was so psyched about getting to see this movie uh, because it was really, really exciting to see this world brought to life in a way that I hadn't seen yet. You know, um, I had read, let's see, by that point I had read, I'd read the, you know, like the main, the main books that had come out by then. Um, I was really, really, really deep into, into, into the novels and super, super entrenched in that world. And, and of course this is, you know, like 15, this is hot, sexy vampires for a young, hot-blooded American girl, you know? So this was, um, I was really, really excited about it. Um, And I loved it when it came out. I have to say, like, not unlike Bram Stoker's Dracula. When it came out, I freaking loved that movie. I thought it was, like, the most epic shit I had ever seen. And that's kind of how I felt about this. I was like, oh, my God, it's so beautiful. Like, and, And a lot of it really holds up. But going back and rewatching it now at 38 years old, there's a lot that does not quite hold up as well for me personally. But at the time, I was absolutely 
thrilled with it. I loved Neil Jordan. I had seen The Crying Game when it came out, and um, I really love his storytelling style. I, I was excited about him directing. Um, I assumed the screenplay would be great since Anne had had written had written it to start with, but then it went through a lot of retooling in the process, you know. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it, rewatching it was an interesting experience. I hadn't really rewatched it from start to finish without any sort of like editing in it. I think like the last time I saw it, it was like on TNT or something. And so going back and watching it all the way through with without any editing for television was really was really a different experience too. Uh, we should mention, by the way, if you're listening to this, the the um, the movie is on the HBO Go service and the HBO Now service. So if you're a HBO subscriber, you can go watch the film without having to purchase it. I think that's the only place that it's streaming right now. It's not on Netflix or, or anything like that, but it is available in you know Amazon's uh, on online store, Google Play's online store, and the iTunes store. You can rent it or or buy it outright. Um, I was a couple of years younger than you, and I had read the first four books that were out at the time, and I was way into it. I had been watching the development of the movie even in like the Fangoria magazines and things like that, like the mm-hmm. on the, the the movie magazines that were very popular at the time, especially the monster ones. Uh, they covered the movie a lot in the production stages, and so I had been tracking it and was very very ready to go. Uh, I was visiting my aunt who lived in. Uh, Baton Rouge at the time, and uh, she and myself and my mom all went to this grand old movie theater uh, with the, you know the giant uh, red velvet curtains on the side of the, the movie theater and everything, um, and saw it there. And it was a great atmosphere to to watch the film. I remember being like you. I was not happy. I liked Tom Cruise at the time quite a lot as an actor, but I didn't think that he was right for Lestat for a lot of reasons, mostly because Anne didn't think he was right. That's what it came right. down to. <laughs> and when she came out and said she was okay with it, uh, and, and had been wowed by his performance, I felt a lot more at ease myself. And so going in, I was, I expected to enjoy myself. I knew the care that had been paid to try to get the, the characters in particular, right. I knew that, you know, Neil Jordan in particular had really focused on Anne's input and had, had tried to make sure that she was happy with the output that they had. And so I felt like it was going to please fans. And at the time, I was a hundred percent pleased. The one thing that stuck out in my head really the most of anything about the, the movie was I remembered that it had the subtitle, Interview with the Vampire, The Vampire Chronicles. They were so proud of themselves and the creation of this movie. They knew that they had a franchise on their hands and they knew that they were going to get to make the next books. And then, of course, they never did right. uh, for, for many reasons. But the I I remembered that and walking out of the theater, I thought to myself, how lucky I am to be alive that I get to see these characters that I love so much realized on screen and then never to see them again in the 20 years <laughs> since basically realized, realized well, um, anyway. And, and so it's, it has been, it's been a long dry spell, but that was the thing that I remembered going into this film is, is I remembered that, that sense of accomplishment and that sense of like satisfaction and that, that grand sense of what was next, you know, and what was coming. Um, and you're right. In retrospect, many, many aspects of this movie do not hold up. They do not hold up at all. Um, so <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's start going into it piece by piece. I love everything about the introduction, uh, of the movie. I love the way that they ease into San Francisco. Yeah. I love the introduction, how they, they go into the room, the introduction of Louis. The reporter is very nonchalant and doesn't take any of this seriously until Louis sort of gives him a show of power. Well, and Christian Slater, who plays Daniel, the interviewer, the reporter, was actually not supposed to be playing that role. That was supposed to be River Phoenix, and he died of a heroin overdose. Like before right production before. Began. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, Christian Slater was a late addition to the cast and also a great love of my life at the particular time. So I was super psyched that Christian Slater was in this movie. Um, And I think he was fantastic. I really, I mean, not that that's a really challenging, super challenging role to play, but I really enjoyed his performance as, as the interviewer. He, he was, here's my thing. He was good enough. There's, there's nothing wrong with him, except for the fact that 
if, especially if you go on and read the other books and you realize that this character has a life and a personality of his own, this, the, as presented in the film, that is just Christian Slater, oh, right? Absolutely. Which, absolutely. which some people would say is a poor man's Jack Nicholson. Uh, well, weirdly <laughs> so, enough, I'm still okay with it. Like, at no, 38, I'm like still okay with Christian Slater. I don't know what, I didn't realize well, that, but apparently I still thumbs up for him. I really do. I think it, I think it is a testament to, and, and I know that's a joke that he's just doing, you know, a bad impersonation of Jack Nicholson, but I think it's a testament. I think it's a testament to both, both of their personalities. First of all, that Jack, Jack's basically played himself for his entire career Absolutely. and we've loved him and awarded him for it. You know why? Cause Jack Nicholson is a very compelling personality. And I think Christian Slater is much the same way. He is a compelling person. He is a very theatrical person in his own, um, sort of, um, you know, whatever his, his affectations. And I think that the fact that he sort of plays himself all the time is fine. Most of the time, really, if you want a Christian Slater there. So, um, it, and he fits in this fine as well, but it, it is one of those things that occurs to me. Other than that, though, I love everything about the introduction, the way that they sort of slowly go into the flashback and the way that they've truncated all of Louis's origin story, I think is fitting. You know, we, we talked a lot when we discussed the novel about um, his brother and that whole storyline that's removed right. in the film. But if you put all of the grief and if you put the desire for death at the foot of his wife and child passing away, it totally makes sense. You don't have to weigh yourself down in stories about ghosts and spirits and the afterlife before we get into the supernatural, which is what this movie is really trying to do so so I, I think this is exactly the sort of segue that you do when you're making a film and not a novel it's Absolutely. the exact thing that you can maintain though when you're making a tv series so i think this is one of the ways that this story will likely distinguish itself when we get to the the television version uh which ann and and christopher have said probably not until season two or maybe even three before we see the actual interview with the vampire story but i think when we see louis story We'll probably get a lot of his mortal life and his brother and sort of like Lestat leering and, and peeking in on this life from afar before he ever actually reveals himself. Yeah, I think that that's I think that that's something that in a series, a television series is, gives you definitely more freedom to expand upon that sort of thing. You know, I think it's something that like even I'm a big fan of Game of Thrones. It's something with like there have been a couple of seasons of game of thrones and i'm like why are you rushing through this why 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 you have time to tell this story why are you rushing um but i didn't feel that way with this movie at all because i do think that that's you do you have to shorten it you have to truncate it you have to you have to get the story rolling otherwise we're just gonna like roll around in louis sorrow and suffering and we do that enough as it is you know what i mean so it could be a real freaking downer if if you know if they spent the first hour of the film taking us through all of why louis wanted death you know well but the interesting thing that you could do because of the way that that they're jumping into lestat story first and they're going to lay out you know basically the the second book first and then back into louis what you could do is you could have two stories working at once. You could have lestat trying to manage his father and trying to find his way in uh, you know the new world while he's also watching Louis and you're getting a glimpse of what Louis's mortal life and the end of that mortal life is like and and the grief that leads him to want to die. Absolutely. All that would while, be a cool way to tell it. Well, not only that, but you could juxtapose that even with flashbacks too. You could go and and see what is happening as the Teatro de Vampires sort of solidifies after Lestat leaves Paris and comes to the new world for the first time. You know, there's a lot of interesting stuff theoretically that happens there with Armand and the Coven. Where, whereas in the first season, he's sort of a antagonist. Armand now has become an ally of, of Lestat to some degree. And those vampires, we, we know we have, um, sort of feelings with them or relationships with them. So you could sort of flesh out that story and that could give you a whole different flavor instead of just dwelling in Louis's, um, you know, melancholy. But you could get more of that and more personality to Louis before he's turned. Absolutely. I think that is a very compelling way that they could make this story stand out and really be different than the interpretation that we've already seen, which, I mean, you'll admit whether you like this movie or not, whether it stands up 20 years after or not, it is very, um, 
I think it's got a lot of uh, cultural appeal still. It has left its mark, so to speak, on our impressions and our our thoughts about these characters and this Absolutely. story. Absolutely, it's and it's it's beautiful. I mean, like. The production elements of this film are absolutely gorgeous. The costuming, the music, the music is so fantastic. I think the score is just awesome. I really do. That was something that going back and rewatching, I was really struck by how how beautiful the scoring is. Oh, the the soundtrack to this film is amazing, and and to me, it's interesting because it sort of it sort of came before a lot of the superhero genre, you know, began to really flesh out. But it has, in many ways, some of those same themes that you might expect from like a Batman or something. There, the, Louis has a theme that returns again and again throughout the film that is not unlike um, a, a hero theme. It's it's very compelling to me. Here's the first thing in the movie that I stood out and I was like, no, this is so wrong. This is so wrong. And it has to be fixed. Uh, Lestat's attack on Louis is awesome. I love the way that you see him there in the tavern and he asks to get shot and the guy sort of wimps out on it and he stumbles outside and he's, uh, you know, having his time with uh, the lady of the night. And then Lestat is upon both of them, kills the lady and grabs Louis. And then what does he do? He flies with Louis. No, no, no. And this is not the only time in the movie. This is not the only time in the movie that vampires fly. Here's the thing. In the books, yes, some vampires have the power of flight. But Louis doesn't even know about that power. He never yeah. talks about that power. No one ever displays that power in the entire first book. Louis yeah. is not aware at the end of the vampire list, or excuse me, at the end of interview with the vampire that vampires can fly. I'm so it's never mentioned. You too. <laughs> that bothers me so much. It's and it, and it, it would be different. Like, and here's the thing: Lestat can't do it at that point either. Lestat no! can't fly. He and I think it's, yet. I think it's possible. I think it's possible that he might have had the power already when he came up at the beginning of the Vampire Lestat, because we we know that when. Uh, vampires go underground. They gain power sometimes after uh, a few decades when they come back up and they, they return to form. Sometimes they have new powers or abilities. So maybe he already grew that power, but probably he didn't. And he didn't know that he could until Akasha made him. Yeah. So like, oh, it's, it just infuriates me. And I understand why they did it at shorthand, right? It's symbolism for the way that the, the vampire's kiss takes you out of the moment. And it's a, it, it's both rapturous and also, um, a, a, a rape symbolism too, right? Like it is, Absolutely. it is both pleasurable and terrifying at the same time. And, and that's fine, Neil, that's fine. Except for the <laughs> fact that if you're going to make all the books, then eventually the vampires are going to fly. So don't do it yet. You know, yep, anyway. Yep. No, I totally agree that that bothers me too. I'm so glad you mentioned it. That was something that really, that had the exact same thought. Like he doesn't know how to do that yet. Why? Why? <laughs> Well, and also, if he could do it, why don't they ever do it again? Why don't they ever mention right. that or use that ever again? Uh, you know, the same thing later when, when we get to Paris, uh, with, uh, Santiago, he, he, he walks on the walls and you're just like, <laughs> no, 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 stop it. Um, <laughs> so, so that's, that's the first thing there though. I, but I, I, I go I ahead. Talk about Brad Pitt for a second, please. Okay, because you did mention that tavern scene where he's like asked to be shot. And I just have to say, like, when I watched this the first time, I was so like in love with Brad Pitt in this film. And when I watched it this last time, I did not have the same feeling. <laughs> I really feel like I'm like, God bless, he is phoning this performance and he is the only time I really enjoy him is when he in his interactions with well, with with uh, Kirsten Dunst, there's plenty of of good action there, you know, with her, um, and then with 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 Christian Slater, I do not enjoy his interactions with with Lestat at all. They're so, ah, uh, it's so cardboard and not not as compelling as it should be. I never feel this like uh, this like I, I don't know this, this dichotomy that he should have where he's in love with him and hates him and pities him and, and is angry at him that like, there's just so much that should be just simmering right under the surface that just is not there. It is not there. Like, I'm like, you're hot. You look real good. You know, so that to me, I, I absolutely hear where you're coming from. And to me, this boils down to three things, uh, as far as Brad's performance. And I do think he's one of the weaker 
links in the whole film, truthfully. His yeah, bummer, man. It is. Uh, it's a bummer. Is, is three things. First and foremost, I think you're right. I think he has zero chemistry with Tom. Now, th- this actor would not be right for the character of Lestat, but just for a moment, imagine a movie where Brad Pitt and George Clooney play vampires that, that have a love hate, uh, you know, mentor makey relationship and imagine the, the, you know, the camaraderie, the friendship that is there, the, the, the seething hatred, the power struggle that they could play sort of below right. the scenes, but also the sexuality, right? Like there would be a chemistry there, a, a sexual chemistry. There wasn't for whatever oh. reason between Tom and Brad and there Zero. needs to be between these characters. Absolutely. Um, so I, I think, I think that's the first thing. The second thing is I think Brad Pitt has tremendously improved as an actor. I think he's I a agree. guy who, who was cast early on because of personal charisma and amazing good looks he Mm -hmm. is just an unbelievably startlingly handsome man especially when he was young and over the years he has to his own credit i think diligently worked and improved his craft he's a much better actor now than then and the third one this is a little bit of a joke but a little bit not if you will watch the best brad pitt performances he eats a lot in them and as a vampire he can't eat the entire film (laughs) He can't. He can't put anything in his mouth. Oh my god! He and I don't. Have I his favorite crutch. It's, no, it's and look, it is. A, oh it's absolutely a crutch. But the fact of the matter is that that man knows how to be naturalistic <laughs> with stuff in his mouth. He does. He knows how to naturalistically eat on That's camera and hilarious. deliver deliver dialogue. And it it is it is something that allows him to deliver. Sometimes uh, Moneyball is maybe the best example of this because he's never without something in his hand or in his mouth trying trying to eat. And he delivers a lot of like really dry, nonsense, statistical dialogue at times in that movie. And yet the whole time you're with him, the whole time you are with his character. And I think it is it's the endearingly human nature <laughs> of feeding yourself, you know, uh, and he can't do that in this movie. So I think he loses his crutch. He's he's a young actor. He's not that skilled to begin with. And then he's got no chemistry with old Tommy boy. That's yeah, that's the I three things that I think come into play. I totally agree with all that. And I did hit up like um, IMDb while I was watching and um and was reading through like their trivia and apparently i did not know this at the time even though like you i was reading a lot of like production magazines i had a subscription to um entertainment weekly at this time and so like i was really keeping up with this movie production as well um but apparently he and tom cruise did not get along very well and there was some tension on set there was tension apparently during when they were like when they would go out and promote the film together so um that I, I, in the imdb trivia it was like he didn't enjoy having to play you know second fiddle to tom cruise tom cruise being at the time the larger star of the two so um that's an interesting thought too that i i had no idea was an issue at all well and it's it's something that with the series you won't have that issue because it'll be clear whose series it is. You know, it is right. an ensemble series and, and there are many wonderful roles from many wonderful actors and actresses, but this series is about the actor playing Lestat. And so like, it'll, that, th- that sort of power dynamic, I think won't be there. That won't be an issue. And I know they will be casting for the chemistry from the very beginning. So, um, it, let's, 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 let me heap a little praise on Tom here for a second. Okay. I like the scene in the book where they flee the plantation, where the sort of the, the jig is up, so to speak, uh, with the, with the slaves, and uh, now they they're going to have to leave. They're going to have to flee. In the movie, it's one of my favorite parts of the whole movie. I love it from Louis finally giving in and killing the slave girl, and then the overwhelming grief. Hey, Newton, he, by the way. Oh, you're right. You're right. I totally forgot about that. And then he carries her out into the yard, hands her over, says, you know, the, your master is the devil, and he torches the plantation. I think it's wonderful. The grief and disgust there from him, it's some of the best stuff that he does in the whole movie. Tom's reaction, though, is what makes it perfect. He 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 bursts into the room. To me, it's hilarious. He says, oh, you're going to burn the whole place down. And every time that I see that, it reminds me of of this moment with my grandmother, my grandmother Sharpton, my father's mother. Um, she was uh, she was like 40 years old when she had dad, and my father was older when he had me. So she has always been a very, very aged woman in my mind. Uh, she passed away years ago. But this one time in particular, we were up at her house. She's from the generation that saved everything, right? She lived through the Great Depression and everything. Right. And so she's got everything in her pantries and in her refrigerator. 
refrigerator. She had gone to church or something that afternoon. My mother took an opportunity. The house is, is quiet. I'm going to empty the fridge and the pantry for her. Terrible stuff in there. I mean, ridiculous, like <laughs> mayonnaise jars from the previous decade, things like that. Okay. <laughs> So grandma was gone. She comes back. She walks into the house uh, and she she sort of shuffles past. She doesn't say anything at first. She doesn't even really. It's like it doesn't register. And then she gets just past mom in the kitchen and she turns back around and she comes back in and she says, what are you doing? And mom's got, you know, a giant trash can out there and there's the fridge is open. She's emptying stuff out. The fridge is mostly empty at this point. She said, what are you doing? And mom says, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm cleaning out the fridge. I'm cleaning out the pantry. I just thought I'd take an opportunity. There was a bunch of really, really old stuff in there, Bertha. You know, I'm sorry, but I needed to do that. Grandma just begins to fume. I mean, like literally like smoke coming out of the top of her head. She screams at the top of her lungs. She says, well, why don't you just strike a match and burn the whole damn place down? <laughs> And every time Tom Cruise rides into this plantation room and starts yelling at, at Brad Pitt about burning the house down, that's what I think. I see Grandma riding in on the horse yelling because uh, we're throwing away her stuff. <laughs> anyway, we, when when he said that this time, I was like, that's that's absolutely perfect. And again, it's one of those moments. I don't, in retrospect, Tom's performance doesn't hold up. I think he did better than I thought he would as Lestat. He has lots of things right, but I think he is limited more than anything by the script and what they asked Lestat to do in this storyline and the idea that they were beginning with Louis' story. I think that inherently limits the character of Lestat, and it's not really Tom's fault. It's it's the time and place that they made the film. Um, but that moment in particular, among a couple of others, was one that I just thought, well, you know what? That's worth the price of admission, Mr. Cruz. Yeah, yeah. He, um, there's definitely some, some, he has some great moments in, in the film. And I, I, I feel like his performance for me, strangely enough, holds up better than Brad Pitt's, which is odd because at the time I really would have thought the exact, oh, I did think the exact opposite. Um, but, I just, that wig is so hard for me to deal with. It just looks like a pageant girl from 84. It's real hard for me. Well, especially when they give it the disheveled look. Like anytime he's perfectly quaffed, it's almost okay. Oh, but see, when, I think that's the worst for me because it looks, it's like too perfect. Oh, <laughs> oh I, I the like worst the for me. Ponytail. Like that, no, that that's the, the when, they, when they sort of pull back the ponytail, but he's got the wings on the side that are loose. That's the worst <laughs> for me. That's the absolute worst because the wings are so clearly not attached to his head. They oh, are not Lord. part of his skull or, or, or uh, you know, body structure anyway that that is that's that's too much so we've praised uh and and derided the the two leads here let's talk about um uh kirsten dunce let's talk about claudia for a minute the best thing in the movie right like in first Still. of all okay so those three those three actors if you think about this if you try to put this movie in the pantheon of performances from those three actors i think this is one of tom cruise's best performances i mean to me it's up there with a few good men as far as the the actual total performance from him mm -hmm. and kirsten dunst i think this is one of her best movies too it just turns out that brad pitt had a lot better performances in him you know like yeah, he absolutely. had a lot better no, movies totally. to make no no um, i totally agree so what what did you think of Kirsten at the time? First of all, she's a lot older than Claudia is in the books, and this is something we've talked about for the series. I think I think if you're going to play any of the sexuality at all, and I think you sort of need to, then I think eleven or twelve is the youngest you can make her appear, and sixteen or seventeen is probably the youngest you can cast her. I, I mean, don't you agree with that a hundred percent? Yeah. And, yeah. and there are, there are many young actresses in that range that could play all the things that you need out of the Claudia storyline at, at about that age, at seeming to be 11 or 12. You don't have to talk specifics. Uh, and, and I think Game of Thrones has done a good job of this. For instance, those children still feel like children, even though they're really late teens and, and early 20 somethings. Um, yeah, and they felt the that way in those too. early seasons. Yes, yes, absolutely. They, You've aged, got they aged those kids up a little bit. I mean, they aged Daenerys up quite a bit. You know, I don't think that we're expected to think she's anything less than like 19 when that series starts. But she's 13 in the book, you know. Yes. Like, yeah, literally a maiden. Uh, yeah, I mean, I you know, Ju Juliet. I could not watch a five-year-old go through Claudia's journey. That would be too much for me. That would be really hard to watch. I think even well, when you read it, I even picture her, I don't picture her as five. You know what I mean? I even picture her older because that's easier for my brain to handle, I guess. 
I think, no, I absolutely agree with you. And a part of that I think is colored because of Kirsten's performance. And, and again, how it's sort of this, this movie has laid itself over, you know, my own memory of the books and my own imagination of the books. But more than that, I do. I think there's sort of, you're, you're protecting yourself from that image that you don't want to imagine. A preteen or a teenager, you can see in peril. You can imagine in peril because you yourself have lived through, um, you know, exciting and adventurous situations when you were in your teenage years or you know other people who have had harrowing experiences in their teenage years but anything happening to a five or a six-year-old just can't feel like anything other than tragedy like yeah, over and over and over again tragedy so and and the other thing is the performance right when you get to the moment where she's plotting and planning where she okay in the film uh kirsten comes and she tells louis her plan Basically, she doesn't spell it out that she's going to kill him, but she says, we've got to rid ourselves of Lestat. We've got to get away from him. And, and Louis dismisses her. Kirsten turns and just says, oh, really? We can't. He, Louis says, we can't do that. And she says, oh, really? And walks out of the room. That chick is cold. You can't get a five-year-old to do yeah. that, no matter how well or how many takes you do. You know, like that's just not possible. So anyway, uh, f- th- for that moment in particular, the scene where she seduces Lestat, you know, to, to apologize with the two twin boys. She's so good in that scene in all of the resolution of the attack on Lestat and his death and then his, his return and, and attack on them again before they leave Louisiana, all that stuff. She's just amazing. And when you go back and think about how old she was and how green she was in the entertainment business, it is really impressive, and I think it speaks volumes to, to what she's capable of as an actress. And I know she's had other good performances. I don't mean to belittle her career, but I do think it's sort of a shame that we haven't seen an adult version of this performance from her. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And I, I sort of – and uh, this is probably going to upset some people, but I sort of feel the same way about, like, a Natalie Portman. I think that, that – these particularly Kirsten Dunst, Natalie Portman, you got some amazing performances out of them when they were very young, like exceptional. Like I feel like this Kirsten Dunst is exceptional in this film. She is to me, she is the best thing in the movie. Like without a doubt, her performance is incredible, I think. And, um, and you just don't like, I don't, and I don't know if maybe roles, you know, like we know, I mean, hell, I'm a 38 year old actor, (laughs) a female, I know how roles start to not be as interesting the older you get. And that's a fact, you know, that's just a sad fact of, of our lives and the way we tell stories. And so I I don't know, I don't know what causes that. But I hope I hope, I hope I get to see some really, really good stuff out of those ladies in the next couple of years. I hope some good roles. I mean, obviously, they've had some great parts, Melancholia and um, Black Swan was amazing, obviously, but like, ugh, I just, I don't know. This is, I just think this is the best thing I've ever seen Kirsten Dunst do. And and the way she, I, I don't know if it's, if it was the direction or if it was just her instincts, but the way she ages, you know, like the way she grows up, that character, and it's so clear in the book. And in the book, it's so, to me, it's so gutting and awful. Like this poor, this woman, she's a woman trapped in a body that does not match her wits or her age or her sexuality or anything. And she's just trapped in a child's body. And to, for a 12 year old to be able to get that to come across is incredible. You know what I mean? Like, and, and they did a lot with changing her costumes um, when they moved to, when they go to Paris and she's wearing more like her dresses are much more like cut like a woman's instead of a little girl's. And, and, and they, some of it comes across in, in all of that, but it's literally, you see it in like her posture and the way she walks and carries herself later her in the film. Her eyes and her smile, her eyes yes. and her smile are the, the biggest two giveaways. Yes. The way that she changes that smile from, from the doting, you know, the moment when she, she pulls off of the first victim and she says, I want some more. Mm-hmm. And, and that exuberance, uh, you know, as a killer to then the, calculated nature with which she drugs and attacks Lestat. Yeah, absolutely. It is a huge change and it, it is fascinating to watch. The interesting sort of subplot to me, and this is something I think that could be played up more in a modern retelling of the story, but even in this version, I was surprised to sort of see it there. Maybe I bring it to the film myself. I don't know, but tell me if you saw it too. I see her story now 
with some sort of allegories for the general, you know, limiting nature of being a, a woman in our society, period. Like, never mind that she's trapped in a, in a girl's body. It's about, it's not about her body, right? It's about how everyone else views her. It's right. about how the world treats her and the lack of respect that they give her because of her physical form. But, but likewise, like your gender and my gender, the difference between the two of them means that you have to go about your entire day in a different fashion than I do, that Absolutely. you have to make business deals in a different way than I do, that you will be treated differently in, in shops and, uh, you know, for services, et cetera, et cetera. Like all of those things to me, I saw a little bit in that, of that in this performance this time. And I'd never really, I'd never really noticed that or thought about that before. That's feminist as hell of you, Joel. I love it. Yeah. yeah I'm woke. I'm woke now, Ashley, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so anyway, I love Claudia. I love Kirsten Dunst in this. And, and the interesting thing, I'm not going to spoil it here, but if you haven't read the most recent books in the series, Prince Lestat and specifically Prince Lestat in the Realms of Atlantis, there are some interesting sort of revelations about the nature of vampirism that make you look back on this whole incident and this whole storyline and Claudia's life a little bit differently than I have in the past. So if you haven't read those yet, um, go, go read those again and then go back and look at the story of Claudia to make you, um, maybe, maybe have some second thoughts about some things there. So interesting oh, stuff. Um, awesome. Oh, 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 it's just before we get off of Claudia though, this is again, one of those moments, uh, for Tom Cruise that I think rises above the rest of it. it when she's apologizing and she's trying to sort of placate him and talk him into everything being okay before she kills him. Of course, he cannot help himself from hurting her, even as he's accepting it, even as he's saying, Oh, well, I'm so glad that you finally saw reason and have come back to your senses, et cetera, et cetera. He, he makes the remark because she says he's, she's got a gift. He says, I hope it's a beautiful woman with endowments you'll never possess. Yeah, and what an asshole. yeah right. Like so <laughs> hateful knowing that this is one of the things that is literally driving his daughter insane, knowing that they have physically fought over this in the near you know past and to st- even while she's apologizing even and he doesn't know that he's a she's a, she's about to try to kill him you know he doesn't know that frat that uh, uh pat- patricide is about to happen here and still he just can't help but turn the knife i'm like you know what you deserve it go go to the i'm always happy to see him thrown in the swamp after that like truthfully. oh god yes it's so good you know and i, I this is also going to be the second time louis freaks out and burns some shit down in this film (laughs) and we're going to get a third round of it at the theater later. I just think that like, that's something that I was like, Louis, all Louis does is get mad and burn things in this movie. And I never really thought that before, but like, no, absolutely. I I had not, I had never noticed that motif either, or that sort of, it is it, it just like the music. There's a theme that they return to, right? Like when, when Louis needs out of a situation, what he does is burn the place down. He's going to burn it down. Um, all right. So let, let's jump on to, to Paris then. And let's talk about, uh, the coven. Let's talk about Santiago first. I've already mentioned, um, so in the books, Santiago does have the cloud gift. I'm pretty sure, but he uses it in the movie to walk up the wall, but nobody ever mentions it. Louis never asks him how he can, how he can fly. Uh, he never says anything to Armand about it. He never asks Armand about it. It's never mentioned to the reporter, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just like, <sighs> of all the things for, oh, and here's the other thing too. Okay. So let's just say, sure, he's got the cloud gift. He can walk up the wall. What part of his vampiric, vampiric abilities allows him to keep his cape also upside down? Perfect. Hat on. Yeah, his freaking hat stays on too. Uh, I mean, and I understand part of that is just practical, right? Like, how do you film the thing? They filmed him right side up and they just turned it upside down. But like, you have to, you have to think about that. And he has to take off the cape then before he does the trick, if that's what you're going to do. It just, those little things in a movie where so much attention was paid to the setting and the, and the mood of the thing and the period costuming and everything else, like, for those little slip ups, that's the sort of stuff that glares at you 20 years out and makes you drop this movie. This is not a classic film that you think of. You know, this is, um, sort of a, a one off that we love because we love the characters. The reason why it doesn't hold up is because of stupid things like that. Agreed. Agreed. Totally. Um, and that's also the sort of thing that ends up in IMDb's goofs list. <laughs> yes. 
That is a that's worse than a continuity error right there, friends. So what did you think about the the Teatro de Vampire and uh, Vampire and, and the way that they were presented in the film? I, the, the scene, the actual scene where we see their performance to me is still one of the most unsettling things I've ever seen on film. It is really, really well done. And that absolutely holds up no matter what else you think about these performances. Oh, no, I totally agree. That's horrifying. That's at, And I often have thought about like how because my brain just works in horrible ways sometimes um, thinking about like how horrifying when everything seems like a fiction, but it's, but something is really, something dangerous is really happening, you know, in that situation where that young woman is about to be straight up murdered in front of this room full of people that think they're watching a fricking play, you know, like that is so horrifying and horrible to me. Um, and that definitely to me, a hundred percent holds up. Um, yeah, I, I wish that the danger felt more real with that coven because it doesn't really feel like it feels like the danger becomes forced, if that makes any sense. Mm, and you mean not, for for, for Claudia Lu- and, yes, for and Claudia Louis. and Louis. Yeah. Yes. And, and it's and it's it's like, OK, are, are you guys concerned because someone made a, a kid vampire or, or are you concerned because you think. They killed the, their maker, but that's never really clear. I, I don't know. Like what's what's very clear in the book is very unclear in the film for me. And this whole section to me with with Armand and I don't know. So much of it feels a little bit forced. Like okay, we have to work these characters in now, and we don't have a lot of time left to do it. So let's kind of rush through this part. I don't know. Well, it felt like there's a cut of this film that is 20 or 30 minutes longer where several of the vampires at the theater have personalities. And what we get instead of that in the film that we're presented with is moments that are personable for several of the vampires, but none of them actually have a life other than Santiago. And Santiago only has a life as an antagonist. You know, there's Armand, which is this sort of like fount of knowledge is the way that he's presented in the film. And he rises above everything, really. He's not almost disconnected from the theater entirely, which is ridiculous when you know that he runs the place, you know? Right. Like, and he says in the film, there's not a leader, but if there was one, I would be it. Um, and, and that is, I think, very true to the books. Correct me if I'm wrong, though. In, in the original Interview with the Vampire book, does Louis know that Lestat is there? In, no. In interview... Okay. In the Vampire Lestat, that's what we discover, right? Is that Lestat came to the theater and told them that well, they, knows, they tried to kill him. He doesn't. He know after he finds out after. I mean, Louis. Louis finds out after. Louis. Yes. Okay. So, so that's what I was. That's what I was unclear on. I was thinking that in the book, we the readers knew, and I was thinking that Louis even knew before he left the theater that Lestat had lived sure, and was responsible for. We, yeah, me too. I'm. I'm going to have to go back and and look. I. We I, just I read think, it, Joel. We just I know. Read it. I think your understanding though is right, and I think that is revealed in the vampire in the book, The Vampire Lestat, not in Interview with the Vampire, yeah, and that Lu- was- Louis may still not know that he is really responsible for Claudia's death in some way. But so that piece of the story, to me, could have been used to give this all more foreboding. If the, if the, if the theater and the vampires at the theater had been sort of like genu- generally welcoming, but skeptical and questioning of Louis and, and uh, Claudia, which is, I think the way they are in the book. And then that had eventually come to a head. Some of those questions had come to a head when Lestat appears right, and challenges them, you know, then you know, it's on and they're probably coming to get us. And it comes from a place where, as you're right, this is, it was, it was like a, a boo scare in the middle of what is otherwise a thriller. This, this movie is not really a, a horror movie. And yet them sort of getting yanked out by the boogeyman felt very much like that. It did not seem connected to much of anything. This whole section feels really rushed to me because I feel like they're even rushing the connection that's building between Louis and Armand, um, which oh, it's totally that again. And I don't maybe I, I don't know maybe young Brad Pitt couldn't develop 
chemistry with with male uh, actors. I don't know because I mean Antonio Banderas has chemistry with everyone he's ever been on screen with, and I mean, yet he here has chemistry with me right now. That's what I'm saying, and, and you've never yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and yet and yet in this movie there's nothing other than the general mystery, which again the film version of Louis has not ever seemed too compelled by questions of right and wrong of origin of the species of things he doesn't seem compelled in the way that young Lestat is like young Lestat wants to know who he is and what he is and where his place is in the universe. Young Louis does not seem to give me that in the movie until he meets Armand. And then he's desperate. He's so desperate for answers that he'll align himself with this sort of shady, uh, questionably ethical character, you know? Yeah. And that seems out of character to me for the Louis that we've met in the rest of the film. Absolutely. If there was more chemistry there, then you, you would understand you know, why it's compelling you. Oh, he, well, he sort of loves him too, but well, th- that's not there. Yeah. And two, also, I think that with Claudia, that, that need she has and, and, and when she's begging him to make her an, another companion, um, when she's begging him for that, because she thinks he's going to leave, like that just comes out of nowhere for me in the film. You know, it's like, she, she's just screaming and crying at him that he's going to leave her. And I'm like, that, that's, that we haven't gotten to that point yet in in this in the build of all these relationships we haven't gotten to that point of desperation yet so i just like i think that that's another thing that that feels so rushed about about this 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 section of the film for me which is like my i love this part of the book which is one of the harder things i think too and i, I do think like as much as I, I adore antonio banderas obviously this was not great casting for this part i mean <laughs> no easily 20 years too old to be playing this role um but he's and i mean he was and he was young don't get me wrong he was young at the time but he was older than brad probably like yeah, there's you, there's yeah, no part of his 30. performance yeah there's no part of his performance that you that you think to yourself what a boyish character yeah. <laughs> which is yeah. precisely what armand is i mean i think what a super sexy vampire but i don't think yeah and, and he is always described as the, as having those boyish the boyish look and looking like, what is it about Botticelli, a Botticelli painting? Is that what you yeah. said? Yes. Yes. Well, it seems to me like, like Antonio Banderas has never read or watched any vampire films or, or vampire books, except for the fact that he went and saw like Gary Oldman in Bram Stoker's Dracula and was like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can do a sexy version of that. I can absolutely do a sexy version of that. Right on um, top of that. Speaking of, by the way, this, this, when Claudia comes and asks for the new companion, this is, I think, probably the worst acting that Brad Pitt may have ever done. The line is, you have it, the vaguest conception under God of what you ask. <laughs> Uh, it's a it's a terrible line performed terribly by a very gifted actor. I, I think Brad Pitt is a wonderful, wonderful actor, and there are so many good performances in his career. But that line is is so bad you haven't the vaguest conception under god of what you ask and he delivers it so ridiculously it's 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 like cardboard in your mouth it's horrible um yeah it feels like george lucas wrote that yeah well and the and (laughs) here's the here's the problem really because of that because of those a handful of stilted moments like that because there's no sort of sense of um anticipation or like uh momentum in the relationship between Louis and Armand it fizzles to me a bit of the grief at the loss of Claudia and the aftermath the wrath where he destroys the theater both of those things ring a little cold and hollow to me in the film whereas in the book i mean they are torturous moments um they just they just don't live up to it because there are so many stilted parts of his performance and and the surrounding relationships don't make sense you know what the where those characters are at that point in the film it just doesn't read yeah it's hard to buy that he cares that much i don't know yeah no and that, absolutely and i will say this i think that that claudia's death scene that is a, a great great special effects like them them like turning to ash I, I still love that. That's freaking horrifying to me. And I, that was something that just like burned into my brain when I watched that movie the first time. And and I felt just as, as horrified watching that sun creep across that. Well, yeah, awful. it is. 
it is very it is absolutely the best i think it's the best effects in the whole film if you look at the the flying is not great in a couple of places uh you know the scenes where um like lestat loses all of his blood and and, and bleeds out and turns into the sort of corpse on the carpet that that doesn't hold up great in retrospect but this scene you're right of them becoming ash and then the ashes uh, you know, being dispersed eventually, both of those really, really solid, um, and absolutely hold up. They, they, they work still 20 years out. The effects were really well done in the beginning. And again, <sighs> the emotional performances there too, from, from yeah. Kirsten and from the other actress. I, I don't, I don't know her name. I didn't recognize her. Um, uh, but the actress that plays, uh, Madeline, um, both of them, I think they're really, really good, and they, and they stand out in what is a lot of uh, soap opera acting from the rest of these these characters. Absolutely, I do think I th- I find Claudia more likable in the film than I did in the book. I think, um, I think that there are because you get to know a little bit of the inner workings of her mind and and how manipulative she is and. Um, in the book a little bit more, you don't really see that in, in the film as much. And I think that that's one of the reasons why it's like, it's so upsetting to me what, you know, what happens to her. I do. I agree with you there too. I think that, um, you know, in some of the, in some of the later books in, uh, in queen of the damned, there's, uh, some discussion about Claudia's ghost and things like that. And I, the, the only time, and maybe it's cause I'm a heartless person, but the only time that I ever <laughs> care about Claudia is, is when, uh, Louis and Lestat are, are sort of grieved by it. When they think about the loss of their daughter and when they think about their own parts to play in her demise, uh, and her sad existence to begin with, that, I, I feel something then anytime someone is talking about the sad life of Claudia, I don't really feel aggrieved by that <laughs> except in this movie. So I think you're right. I think it is Kirsten's performance that, that really brings it to life for me. Um, let's, uh, what, what else do you have to say about that little, the section with Armand and, and Louis? Uh, it, it's briefer in, uh, reality than it was in my memory. In my memory, they spent a longer time together after the theater. It's really just one scene before he goes back to, um, America. But, um, to me, they, they sort of sum that part of the book up very well. They, they make it make sense. Whereas the rest of the relationship doesn't make sense. Him tiring of Armand and deciding to leave makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, because he was never that into him anyway. Yeah. At least that's how it felt. <laughs> No, I agree. I agree. I think that, I mean, we've got to move on, you know, as far as the movie goes, you've got to, you, you've got to move on to the next thing at this point. I think that that, that that's, they, they do tie it up nicely. So it's interesting to me that this movie ends so clearly setting up the next story. Like really the, the, it doesn't have an ending. Like you get a little small resolution there when he goes to see Lestat. And, and I guess there is some satisfaction in the fact that you see that Louis doesn't need him. He's forgiven himself for his responsibility in, um, you know, trying to destroy Lestat. He's forgiven Lestat for, bringing him into this world this way and for his, uh, you know, harsh treatment of Claudia, et cetera, et cetera. And he's just walking away from it. He doesn't need Lestat. He doesn't need to hate Lestat. So that's satisfying, I suppose, but that's not really a movie ending. And, and the same thing with the reporter you get there and the reporter's mad. Cause he doesn't, Louis doesn't want to turn him into a vampire. And then Louis just vanishes. So what do you do? You get the tease of the return of Lestat and you get Lestat beginning to turn the interviewer into a vampire and you get the promise that there's going to be the next story. And I remember walking out of the movie theater so jacked up to see that one, to see Tom Cruise singing rock songs and flashing back to the first time that he met Marius and those who must be kept, et cetera, et cetera. Like, and I thought that was going to be like two years later, you know, but nope, nothing for like a whole decade. And then they bring out something with a bunch of different actors and they skip straight to queen of the damned. Like, and it was, Oh, Oh (laughs) yes. Oh yeah. And I know we have some, some, uh, listeners that appreciate queen of the damned and we will get there soon enough, but but no, 
it was not, not it was what not what we were be. promised <laughs> exactly exactly and and as and as many holes as this film has i do think it is very sad that we did not get at least another story or two out of this same creative team and you know some people i've heard in the fandom say well i'm glad we didn't because now the series will take place i think if you look at the landscape even if there had been, I think if there had been a couple of movies, we might have gotten a series earlier. I, I think agree. the fact of the matter is that this this um, series and these characters had sort of fallen out of mainstream culture's memory a little bit. And we're lucky that she got the rights, that Anne and Christopher got the rights and were able to push it. And that is, I think, going to bring it back into people's idea. But I think we would have gotten the series anyway, uh, a TV I- series e- anyway, in this modern era of storytelling, if the characters had been you know, further fleshed out. If you'd seen Tom and Brad in another movie or two, which I think that's the way they would have done it at the time. It's very likely they would have done a back to the future style. We'll film two at once so that we can save a bunch of money. They would have spent, you know, uh, a little shy of 200 million on both of them uh, combined or something like that. And then tried to put them out two years in a row or something. But I, I think, I don't think that would have ruined the story. I don't think that that would have kept us from what we're about to get. No, and Hollywood is in such, I say Hollywood, not just Hollywood, but at theater, everything is in this reboot mode. So hardcore. I mean, good Lord, I've seen three different versions of Spider-Man in the last 10 years. And so, like, I, I totally agree with you. I think that if, if a couple of films had, had rolled out, a couple more films had rolled out, it would have been on people's minds fresher, more, more fresh on people's minds. You know what I mean? I do think they kind of fell out. I mean, it even, I mean, it even happened with me as a reader, right? I haven't read the last couple of books. I'm behind. I'm catching up to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. And I think that that is now, thank goodness that that's what we're going to get with this series. Um, so overall it is not the film that we remember it to be, I think, and not the film that we wanted it to be necessarily, but better than what we've gotten, uh, since. Yeah. I'm not uh, mad with, about it. I'm not, you yeah. know, I'm not mad about it. I just, I wish, you know, like I wish it felt the same. I mean, it still feels the same way as it did. I wish that I, I wish the performances were better. I felt the same way when I went back and watched Bram Stoker's Dracula, which I thought was the absolute bee's knees. When that movie came out, I was like, oh, my God, this movie's everything. These performances are epic. And then I go back and rewatch it. And I'm like, "Ugh!" like, I'm not even sure what Anthony Hopkins is doing some of the time in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so this so, kind of had the same sort of experience with this that I was just like, oh, this was better in my mind. <laughs> part of it has got to be the era, right? Like part of yeah, it is just like so. the the 90sization of things. Uh but but there is no doubt about it that uh these films in particular, I, I think it was a matter of if you were a fan of a certain type of story if you were a fan of you know some more genre type ideas and concepts and series then anytime you got a film was a rare occasion um and so you were happy to get it and you sort of reveled in it no matter what the quality was and i think we're just spoiled in the modern era that we get so many quality retellings of uh, books and and series that we've already got a love for characters that we already know uh and um admire yeah i have to say this when we i remember when i watched this movie i don't think i saw this in the theater i think i saw this the first time i think we rented it i really do like i really think that that I think I watched it at home the first time. And when that beautiful car that Christian Slater's driving (laughs) goes off and rakes down the side of that uh, bridge, everyone in my family, my, I remember my father in particular being absolutely horrified that something so hideous happened to to that, to that beautiful, beautiful car. Cause that is a sexy ass car. Uh, no, so uh, I, I like the car. I'll agree with you. But the thing that that makes me think about though, is the guns and roses version of sympathy for the devil, which was one of my favorite (laughs) covers of all time. And it's still pretty awesome. I got to tell you, if Anne and Christopher want to license that and use it as the theme song for the TV show, I'm not going to be mad about it. I I won't be mad about that. Yeah, no, I agree with you. It's excellent. Um, it probably introduced a whole, a whole new generation to, the Rolling Stones. So 
Absolutely. Thanks, absolutely. Thanks, Santa Rosa and Anne Rice. Uh, real quick, before we wrap up today's episode, I do have a little bit of listener feedback. Our, uh, my friend and yours, uh, Jennifer, um, Jennifer wrote in, uh, on our Facebook group, which by the way, you can search for Articulate Coven and find us on Facebook. Uh, there is a link in the show notes as well. Jennifer says, I auditioned for the interview with the vampire movie. It was yes, in New she and Orleans. I talked about this not too long ago. Uh, she said, I stood in this long ass cattle call line for most of a day with my friend. She got a stint as an extra and I didn't. Ha ha. So sad. Anyway, I think you can see her arm in one scene of the movie. She said the couple <laughs> of days of shooting was an incredible experience. I'm sure they were. Harumph. Anyway, I just thought you might find that interesting. We find that very interesting, Jennifer. <laughs> um, you know, being from Louisiana and especially for those of us that were, a lot of our friends were raised in South. South Louisiana in and around New Orleans, they're really, even, even when we were growing up, but especially in the last, let's say 10 or 15 years, there've been a tremendous amount of opportunities to sort of, uh, have your brush with Hollywood. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, with all the film credits and things, that's really what got the ball rolling down there. And the, especially in the last 10 or so years. Uh, yeah, I was listening to the uh, director's track, director's commentary for the second Planet of the Apes film, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, and I'd forgotten, but they filmed that entire thing down there, or almost the entire serious? thing. Yeah, absolutely. They so the, the 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 apes encampment is all or was all built uh, outside the old Six Flags Jazz Land where the rundown theme park is. Oh There's a lot of territory God. there that's totally grown over, and they they had it set up there, and then the human encampment the the um, um, the downtown, what is or what was San Francisco, the post-apocalyptic San Francisco, they shot a lot of that in downtown New Orleans. They would block off several city blocks at a time and sort of dress it, and then they did some CGI overlay, uh, and then of course, you know, totally CGI'd intros and outros to those scenes. But the sets themselves were built in New Orleans. Yeah. So anyway, lots of uh, foot traffic, movie traffic, and I, I imagining whenever the series begins to film. You gotta think some of it at least will be shot in in Louisiana, don't you think? Oh God, I hope so. I, every time I'm down, I mean, my husband and I, we try to get to New Orleans at least once a year, sometimes twice if we can be really greedy. And um, every time we're down there, something's filming. Every single time we're down there, they're filming something. And so, um, please, God, there's nothing like that city. You, you, it's, it's. I can't imagine being able to create that the energy of that city. In a, just on a sound stage, you know what I mean. It just, uh, but I mean, absolutely, I'm, I'm in love. absolutely, I'm in love with New Orleans, so. Uh, you know, New Orleans and then the surrounding, you know, countryside and the smaller towns uh, and cities around New Orleans uh, can all fill in for lots of places across the globe, but absolutely. there's nowhere that can fill in for New Orleans. So I am absolutely hopeful that they'll film again, at least maybe a season or two uh, in our neck of the woods. All right, let's wrap this one up because it has been a little bit long. Uh, right. That is our cover of uh, Interview with the Vampire, the movie. What's next on our docket? Uh, Ashley and I are already listening to The Vampire List at or reading the vampire list at again the novel we'll cover that for you we'll go into um queen of the damned and then we will be back with an episode about the movie queen of the damned we'll do it in that in that order don't you think we got to do the books oh, first yes of course and we have to do that movie we have to people will be sad <laughs> Oh, very much so. I, I got to tell you, I've only seen it once, and it was literally like right after it came out on video. I watched it once, said it's horrible, never looked at it again. So I am actually excited to dive back in and try to find a few uh, positive moments to pull out and things that uh, that they did right that perhaps the series can can use as well. Um, I appreciate you for listening to us, and if you have some friends that are Anne Rice fans, Vampire Lestat fans, or Vampire Chronicles fans, please point them in our direction. Tell them that they can find Articulate Coven on iTunes. Uh, Apple Podcasts, the Stitcher app, anywhere else that they find podcasts. Ashley, you got anything to add before we wrap up? Not a thing. Thank you for hanging out with us. Hey, thank you. And don't forget to find us on Facebook for more conversation in the Articulate Coven Facebook group. Until next episode, we've been your hosts. Ashley wright And Joel Sharpton. And we are the Articulate Coven. Thanks for listening to The Articulate Coven. You can join our community on Facebook by following the links in the show notes or searching for Articulate Coven on Facebook. You can subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, 
or at articulatecoven.com and share us with your Anne Rice loving friends. <laughs>